So I have a message for the entire church family. As I've noted, we're kicking off the new year. Uh, if the past couple of years means anything or has taught us anything, some of us wearing masks, masks are, you know, it's, it's Omicron or COVID 3.0 or whatever, you know, iteration of this thing is. But we, we, we learned this the past couple of years. If we didn't know this already, we don't know what's coming, right? And we don't have all the answers, but we know the one who does. And that's not just a cliche. That is the truth. God is the one. It starts with him. And so everything in life starts with him. And here it is. Everything starts with prayer before him. And so as we were praying, thinking through how might we enter into this new year, I want this to be the year. And really, God, I believe, has impressed this on my heart that this would be the year in his presence. And really a year of prayer as a church family. Our focus. You'll hear a lot about prayer, lots of opportunities about prayer, and we're kicking off this new year with a new series, seven weeks. It'll take us, um, hard to believe, all the way to the Easter season, which is Ash Wednesday and beyond. Seven weeks, we're going to focus on the Lord's Prayer. We're calling it Patterns of Prayer. And I'll begin with this. Um, Yuri Gagarin was uh, the first cosmonaut uh, to orbit the planet, maybe you know this, in 1961. Uh, he was, you know, part of, uh, during that time, it was Khrushchev who uh, was the first uh, secretary of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, a staunchly atheistic regime. And when, the, when Gagarin and his crew got back, uh, it's noted, it said that he, then Khrushchev said, well, our crew uh, went up high enough into space to discover that there is no God in heaven. Uh, then the story goes that a uh, Orthodox priest then responded, uh, sir, you will never find God in heaven until you find him here on earth. And this creates not only really uh, speaks to the purpose of prayer, speaks to, I think, kind of the problem of prayer. That is the purpose is that sure enough, think about it in prayer, heaven and earth interact they connect in fact jesus we know in the lord's prayers we'll see later on uh he prayed we prayed it earlier some of us will pray it again that the kingdom of god would come on earth as it is in heaven all of this begins with our relationship with him in prayer martin luther the great reformer said this prayer is central key to the christian life to be a christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing it's that much of our, of, our, of our lives. He also said, I love this, with all everything's attributed to Luther. He said, uh, pray, let God worry. Somebody needs to write that down. Okay, that's, that's a good one to apply this week. Yet all of us seem to struggle in prayer, don't we? We struggle. And my favorite monk, Thomas Merton, he said this, we do not want to be beginners at prayer, but let us be convinced of the fact that we will never be anything but beginners all of our life. All of life. We're all beginners in prayer. And that should be uh, kind of a unifying thing. And it should be maybe a humbling, uh, a settling thing. We'll always be learning in prayer. Uh, Martin Lord jo- Jones said, uh, faith is the refusal to panic. And faith is expressed first through prayer. When we start to panic, when we sense some anxiety and worry, what do we do? Do we pray first or is it our last resort? You see, uh, here's the problem. We think we don't know how to pray and so we don't pray. And, and, and many of us don't pray as we should. And the number one, I've said it before, reason for unanswered prayer is prayerlessness. And we're going to see that Jesus turns prayer upside down, if you will. He does some teaching ahead of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 But what if prayer, I got two confessions today. How about this? Two mass confessions in front of my church family whom I love. Lots of grace about prayer. First, I used to think that prayer was this. My responsibility is to pray and ask God for things. His responsibility was to act, right? He's the one who does the action. I I ask and he responds. Now, you you can see right away that there's a problem there. And yet we approach prayer that way, don't we? we? We often see prayer where maybe, watch this, here's my point. Maybe I'm the one who's acting. Maybe actually prayer, here's the paradigm shift. Prayer is actually not me asking for things, but instead it's me aligning my life up with what God is about, what he's doing. 
in the world. That is a major shift in prayer. And that's what we see is being taught in the Lord's Prayer. So one day, a disciple came to Jesus, and they've been watching him pray. And can you imagine that? And then they say, Lord, teach us to pray. In essence, teach us how to do that. What you do right there, teach us that. And that's what then leads to a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11. We're going to look at the longer version in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. You can turn there if you're not already there. So turn there, click there, find your way. And if you're watching online, and a lot of people are watching online today, um, turn in your Bible to Matthew 9. All right. Now notice that Jesus doesn't respond with a method. He doesn't respond with a class on prayer. He doesn't respond with here's 10 points on how you pray. Instead, he offers what is, watch this, this prayer captures the essence of the Christian faith. This is a summary of all that it means to be a disciple of Jesus. In fact, this, this prayer became a treasure to the early church. So much so, before baptism, people would memorize this prayer and they would repeat it three times a day, a practice that I've entered into myself. Uh, morning, noon, noon. And night, one that I want us all to enter into, along other applications here today. But they would they would enter that. Now I said I had two confessions. Um, the second one is for years. This is a little embarrassing, but I'm going to say it. Um, for years, I saw the Lord's Prayer as this kind of like a spiritual Christian incantation, like a rote, cold kind of thing that people. Would say, and granted, probably because I saw a lot of that. Maybe I entered into that myself. Uh, I remember playing before basketball games and such. It was the one prayer we could agree on, right? And so, Lord, He's just, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, um, give us this day our daily bread. Is it trespasses or debts? I don't know which one. Where are we going? Where are we going with? Okay, let's beat these guys. Let's destroy these guys. That's all I want to do. And, and I thought, this is the weirdest thing. And so for me, I, you know, I moved from, from, uh, from that to, uh, to, to, you know, realizing then, here it is, here's the, the confession where it goes. Then I learned what it's about. Then I came to understand it. Changed my life. And this is why I'm so passionate about this. I believe, now getting back into it myself in recent days, past month or two, I am believing that this is going to change our church family and change your life in big ways. I really believe that. If you are serious at all about following Jesus... You are going to be serious. You're going to have a desire to pray. You're going to want to learn how to pray more. You're going to want to grow constantly in prayer. And so over these next seven weeks, don't miss one. We're going to be talking about each line in the Lord's Prayer. And you're going to see that that this prayer destroys any idea that the Christian faith is this, this little individualistic relationship between me and Jesus. It goes so far beyond that. Tertullian, who was a second century pastor uh, in a Christian community in North, uh, North Africa, he said that he referred to the prayer as an abridgment of the entire gospel. Okay, so a brief of the entire gospel. 18 centuries later, Rowan Williams, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury, was asked if he could summarize the Christian faith. And he said, anytime someone would ask him, he would write down the Lord's Prayer. Bam, there it is. Andrew Haas, who is, um, I mean, Albert Haas, who's a priest, uh, who's written one of the best books that I have read in recent days on the Lord's Prayer. The, you can find all this on our sermon response guide, all these resources. And if you stay online, you'll see them after our service is over. He says this, it is a trustworthy guide for spiritual formation and a compact handbook for holiness. It, it is a prayer to be prayed by kingdom people is what it is. It shows the way of Jesus and the way of disciple. Every line offers an identity and then some principle and an action that we'll see today. Now, we're going to memorize it together, okay? And we're going to go with the ESV um, because it's close to the King James where some of us have memorized it, but it's not the King James. Um, you'll notice that the doxology on the back end is not, uh, thine, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, I'm in. Um, not a part of the Lord's Prayer. It's not in uh, modern translations because it was not in, early, in the earliest manuscripts. So I don't know if that throws you off much. Uh, N.T. Wright, among other scholars, would have said, surely the prayer would have ended with something like that. Um, so let's do it. I want to do it again. I know we, uh, we're praying it often. We're going to pray it again. We're singing it. But I want us to say it together, and you'll see it there on the screen. Let's say it together collectively. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We wanted our entire church family, as we'll do, together, saying it together. Today we're going to look at what some call the prayer. We're going to look at the Our Father. Uh, Our Father in heaven. So I want you to see three things today. The Our Father will uh, display or express, it reveals three things. The first is our truest identity. Uh, The second, it reveals uh, our deepest relationships. And finally, our highest calling. Okay, so first, our our truest identity. Our our, uh, English translation, Father, um, falls short, kind of stumbles awkwardly towards the real meaning, the true depth and emotional weight of this word. The word that Jesus would have used in Aramaic uh, is the word that also you can still hear in the Middle East today. If you've been to the Holy Land, you can be around a family or walk the streets and you'll hear this word. You likely know it. You can hear it in Aramaic, same word in uh, Arabic, same word in Hebrew. Anybody know what the word is? Abba. Abba. The word is Abba. And this word is is the word that Jesus uses here. Here, listen to this. Jesus calls God by the same name that he would have called Joseph growing up. And even even in his latter years. Because uh, that that, that name, it's a a wonderful word of endearment. Uh, It's a word of respect. That's where we lose a bit of it. Some have said, I've heard, well, that's like daddy. It's like dada. And no, it's more nuanced than that. Uh, It's more of a sign of respect. You could say it to older people, uh, for instance, that weren't your father. Abba is a word of respect, but it's a word of closeness. It is a, I would say it this way, for Jesus to call God Abba was a showstopper. It was startling. It was scandalous. It, it, it It was the sort of thing that didn't belong anywhere in the temple. And it certainly didn't belong on the lips of a rabbi. This was earth shaking. We need to grasp that, first of all. You see, Israel already knew what the name of God was. They already knew his name. Anybody? Yahweh was his name. Yahweh was his name. The the, the word that they couldn't even say out loud. Sorry, Jewish friends. Um, The tetragrammaton, it's it's four letters. It's Yahweh. And they even went to the the lengths of saying, well, let's don't. We can't say it, so then it became, you know, Adonai, or it became Lord, you'll see sometime in all caps. It became uh, Jehovah. I was speaking at at an event years ago here um, called Fast Break, and I've I've heard this story before. We had a a ministry to the um, North Dallas business business community at lunch. I was speaking probably on something like this, and I was saying Yahweh throughout my talk. Afterwards, a... um, an Orthodox Jewish man came up to me and he was offended, kindly, offended that I had been saying Yahweh throughout my entire time because he was noting, you don't say that out loud. And so two things there. One, have we lost that kind of reverence for God? I think so. Secondly, the reason we think that's a little strange is because of Jesus. (laughs) Jesus is the one who said that you call him father. See, we didn't need Jesus to tell us that God is big, right? Every Hebrew knows that. Every Hebrew knew that. Every person on the planet that might think of some kind of God probably thinks he's big. We don't, you know, we didn't need Jesus to tell us that God is great. Every Muslim on the planet knows that. Only Jesus has taught us that God is near. Yes, he's transcendent. He's holy, but he is imminent. He has come to us. And this is what it means when we say that he is our father. He is with us. What this means, listen, there's a familial depth and a weight to this that means that the undivided divine attention of God is focused on you like a new parent contemplating the firstborn. The gaze of the God of Israel was fixed, riveted on his son, Jesus. And if you're in him, if you have received his grace, we too are brought into that. Adopted in the family with all the rights and privileges of his son. This is mind-blowing. Friends, what I'm trying to say is it should awe us that we can call him father. I think of my own children when they were born. Well, each one of them, Whitney was the firstborn of our twins. I remember just like, oh my gosh, just holding her. Oh, there's another one coming, you know, but, um, but wow. I mean, for 23 minutes, 
Um, I was like, oh my gosh. And then with Emily and then Travis, and then when they were younger, some of your parents know this. I, there were times when we would just like, you'd go in and they'd be sleeping. And it's kind of creepy because I did it when they were you know, even a little bit older. But yeah, I'd go in and I'd be like, oh my gosh. I just pray over them and just say, I love you so much. I remember holding um, you know, each one of them and like, I would die for you right now. You hadn't done anything. I would lay down my life. That means a different kind of love. And every parent knows that. What I'm trying to say is this. It should awe us that we have that kind of attention, that kind of focus from our Father. Our Abba is looking at us in the same way. Listen, friends, we are crazy to call him Father. This is nuts. And this means that our identity is fixed. Our truest identity is not, listen, not received. I mean, not achieved, but but received. It's not achieved my children, it's like Jesus at his baptism. This is my son. He hasn't done anything. He, he has done a miracle one. He hasn't taught anything I, in whom I am well pleased. This is the gaze of the Father in his heart towards you. This is how we should approach prayer. And many of us have got the Father wrong. Do you know him? Do you know him today? Have you said yes to him? His sacrifice, Christ, comes to us so near. He comes and he dies on the cross for us. And, and, and he gives us his life so that we have a relationship with him. Takes on our sin. Takes away our shame. And this division between sinful people and a holy God has been broken down. Our Father in heaven reveals our truest identity. Look at this. Secondly, it reveals our deepest relationships. We've already talked about this one aspect of our adoption as sons and daughters, our father reveals our relationship with him. That's where it all starts. It also, notice it's our father. This is not go hide out and have your devotional time and try to follow Jesus. This is life in the body. We are brothers and sisters. It connects us with each other. It connects us with ourselves, makes it right with ourselves and with others. Our father, notice he's our father in heaven. Now this is not a description. This is really important of where God is. This, is. this is who he is. To say that he's in heaven, we're not assigning him off to a faraway place. And some people, uh, that's how, uh, what, we, what we think. A lot of religions, that's it. He's off in heaven somewhere. But instead, we're expressing the fact that he cannot be contained. He's incomprehensible, but we're not assigning, he's not assigned to any place. He's beyond any place, is what this means. Which means then that he is right here, right now, with us, in relationship with you all the time, if you know him. He is with you right now. And I want to say, in your worst day, in your most difficult season, some of you are going through the hardest, darkest days of your life. He's with you, always, and he's with you now. And he's also with us as brothers and sisters. Here's the beautiful thing. You are my sister. You're my brother. I'm your brother. We know who our father is. We are eternally connected. That's the beauty of the church. We're to show the world then, as his children, what it looks like to love each other, what love looks like in mob form, what love looks like in a family. And so together we do this. One of the things I do at the beginning of every year, I kind of re-up, I recommit to the relationships in my life. Always wanting and seeking new relationships. We have levels of relationships. I have a group of friends that, and I've shared this before, but I have a group of friends. We text every day, already been texting today. I'm like, guys, stop. I'm, I'm about to preach. Okay, stop. And it'll probably happen um, while I'm preaching. These guys, I have been in relationship with them and community with them since I was in high school. I mean like lifelong friends. And the reason I say that is because the older I get, the more those friends matter. If you're younger, hold on to your closest friends. It takes work. And these are my brothers from way back. We've done life together uh, from the time we were in a Bible study and even prior to that with a couple of guys. And, and I mean, the depth of relationship, it's like Ben Rector sings. Um, there's, you know, you, you, there's nothing like old friends because you can't make old friends. And we need to hold on to old friends. So many people my age and older have very few friends. And, and, and this is the beauty of the body. There's nothing like friendships in Christ. And here's a good time. I want us to pause for a moment. And I want us to do this. It's a good time to ask the question, what kind of father is he? Now, we've answered that to some degree. 
But the, G, the answer that Jesus gives us is found, again, not in a textbook, not in a formula, in laying out 10 points. Instead, he tells a story. And where we see the story of the father and what he's like is in Luke 15. You could turn there. I'll buzz through it pretty quickly. This is where we find the, the story of the prodigal son, it's called. This might, I want to go here for a moment, and then we'll get back to my third point. Because this might be the most important question in all of prayer. What kind of father is he? What is he like? Who are we talking to? And this is where I think we need to do a lot of work, some of us. In particular, because we've had a hard time transferring our earthly father to the heavenly father. Jesus says, you want to know what the father's like? Watch this. In verse 11 and 12, uh, we see that the, the story starts, a man had two sons. Um, he's answering the question to, to, or challenging some Pharisees. This whole thing is structured really to focus on the older brother, by the way. But here's what we know right from the start. He, he's, he, the, father, the son comes to him, the youngest son comes, and he says, hey, I want my inheritance now. And I'm, I'm going to assume you know this story a little bit. Um, and, and he's saying, in essence, I want from you what you can give me. I don't want you. A lot of us approach prayer that way. Think about that. Are you just coming into his presence or is it what you, it's a law of reciprocity. The son comes to him and he says, I want your, I want, I wish you were dead because I want your inheritance. And here's the crazy thing. The father goes, okay, have at it. Here's the thing. We, we need to know this going in. He is a steady, he's a secure father. He, he doesn't need anything outside of him. And, and I don't know how this makes you feel. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need my love. He doesn't need anything. We call this in theology, it's the, the aseity of God. It's a Latin term that means from self. We've talked about this before. Uh, but God exists in and of himself. He doesn't depend on anything. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. And, and within himself is his own reason for existence. He is the I am. He's the great I am and always will be. Now, we want him to need us. Like, well, if I do this, then, you know, you can owe me this, right? And if I do this, we want a point of leverage. And there's no leverage with him. He's holy. He doesn't need you. And so he tested the son, have at it. What's he doing there? Watch this. He's a patient father. Verses 13 through 19 of the story tell you what the son does as he goes off. And he's a train wreck. He lets the son go. Why? Because he wants the, the impact, natural consequences, if you will. I could argue supernatural consequences. Natural consequences of his sin to take their full effect. The, the consequences of his rebellion to take their full effect. And the father goes, go. You want life without me? Let's see how that goes. He's a patient father. He waits. And then watch this. I love this. In verse 20 and 21, the, the climax of the story in a lot of ways, he's a running father. He is a running father. This is the only time in scripture we see God running. And this is interesting because no man in the ancient culture like this would be running. No father would be running. Totally in, undignified. Completely inappropriate. And he's running, the only time, to a repentant sinner who he's been waiting on. I say this because this is, listen, have this in your mind this week. When you approach God in prayer, he's already running at you. You're not pleading, you're not begging him to listen. You're not, God, please, will you, like, where are you? He's like, I'm here. I've been waiting for you to come to me. Remember this image as you pray this week. Not only that, he's a forgiving father, right? Verses 22 through 24, uh, the, the son has prepared this speech. And the father won't even let him, let him finish it. Like, whatever, let's party. You're here, you're back. He's a forgiving father. He runs and he embraces him, hugs him. What a beautiful story, but a great picture of who the father is. And then finally, he's an inclusive father. And what I mean here is the, the whole story is not so much about the prodigal son. He's kind of more, more verses there. It's really the loving father is the story. But you could also, it's what Tim Keller calls in a great book on this um, parable, uh, the prodigal God. Prodigal meaning extravagant, lavish, you know, just over the top is what that means. And that's his love for us. He's inclusive because not only does he welcome the, the young son uh, in, the, the rebellious son, he welcomes or wants, he calls the elder, dutiful, self-righteous son in. He said, come on, join the party. And he gives no sign of repentance and he will not come. And then Jesus flips that whole story and he says basically to people like me, sorry, like us, to the Pharisees certainly, you're the older brother. You're the older brother. 
Come join the party and celebrate those who have gone crazy because they're back home. He welcomes all of us. Watch this. Because he's Abba Father. Our Father in heaven means that uh, our truest identity is secure. It reveals our, our deepest relationship. And then finally, I'll close with this. It, it reveals our highest calling. Our highest calling. Our Father connects us to every person on the planet. And here's why. Not everyone is a part of the family. And he's calling us to live as children of God in the world. That's what the Our Father calls us to. Our highest calling is to be his representatives. And, so, and here's, here's where I want to just say a word about this. I've talked a lot about this over the past couple of years. But this means that he is present with us as children of God. We go into the world and he's with us all the time. So much suffering in the world today and in our lives originates from the fact that we lack an attention to the present and whomever God's placed in front of us. I'd say it this way. Right now, where the action is as a disciple of Jesus is nowhere else but right here, right now. This is true in five minutes. It's true tomorrow morning when you get up. It's true tomorrow at noon. Every day, one of the, one of the most important aspects of spiritual formation is to understand that the great commandment to love my God, my Father, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the great commission to go forth and make disciples comes together with love of neighbor. That's where it happens. And that is the center action point of this prayer. You and I are, are sons and daughters of the Most High King, our Father Abba. Romans eight fifteen says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, And here at the beginning of this new year, let's press on into him. Let's run to him as he's running to us. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You'll notice throughout the New Testament, it's translated that. It says, Abba, you know, know, that's a a word that means father. It's kind of how that goes because they couldn't quite match it. And the weight of it, even in the Greek, you couldn't, with, with pater, you couldn't match it because there's such weight there. This week, let's apply it. I'll close with application. This week, I want you to memorize the Lord's Prayer. Okay? And, and again, we'll do it out of the ESV because we can do it together uh, there. It's, it's debts as we have already forgiven our debtors. And I want you to pray it three times a day. Okay, start your day with it. Pray it um, morning, noon, and night. I want you to um, look at the sermon response guide. I have it for some, but it is an incredible resource with lots on this message. Um, uh, I've I've mentioned some resources that you can go to, books to read, uh, but also it can be used as quiet time. So do that uh, tomorrow. Do it later today and dive deeper in. Come join us in the chapel uh, Monday through Friday. Um, We've been doing this, and you can come tomorrow. Uh, from 11 to 1, and uh, that goes all the way to April 15th, which is the Friday. That'd be Good Friday. This is the Friday before uh, Easter. We're going to be, so come and find a, a quiet place there. Skip a lunch, you know, fast and pray. Um, every, every day, Monday through Friday, we're called to invite people into our family. And so this week as we go, uh, remember that the Our Father, Abba, has determined for us our truest identity, our deepest relationships, our our highest calling as we go to bring heaven to earth as we live for him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this amazing truth that Jesus, you have revealed to us that God, the, the Holy One of Israel, Yahweh, is our Father. It awes us today that we can call you Father. And I pray that we'll do so throughout this coming week as we give our lives to you fully and live for you. Bless our church family, I pray. Bless us as we go now to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.